Take your copy of God's Word, turn with me to the New Testament book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, we'll be in verses 1 through 23 this morning. Matthew 13, verses 1 through 23. Uh, you remember we were in this text last Sunday morning, and we talked about the sower. This morning I'd like to focus more on the seed. And uh, if I were to entitle the message, I'd call it, The Seed Will Prevail. The Seed Will Prevail. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, The same day when Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Verse 4, And when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, uh, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, but other fell upon good ground and uh, brought forth fruit, some in hundredfold, some thirtyfold, and some uh, some sixtyfold and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto us in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And he shall have, no, have more abundance, but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Verse 13, Therefore speak I unto them in parables, because they see and see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not per perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their e eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have, de or, uh, have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Verse 18, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, he under and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that receives seed in the stony places, the same he is he that heareth the word, and Annan with joy receiveth it. Verse 21, Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, riches uh, choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Uh, Verse 23, but he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, of, the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some in hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirty. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We pray, God, that you'd open blinded eyes this morning, open blinded hearts. We pray, God, that you would remove, Lord, the devil's work in people's hearts this morning. Remove all hindrance, Lord, that would hinder anyone from coming to Christ and having a deep understanding this morning. God, we love you. We thank you. Holy Ghost of God, we welcome you into this place and in the hearts and the lives. We welcome your correcting work. God, move in me. Help me to stay yielded to thy word, Lord God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, uh, the seed will prevail. I, I want to focus on this point this morning. Last week we saw the sower, but today I want to I want to focus on the, the, the prevailing of the seed of the Word of God. Uh, you know, I think about it this morning, and I think back to uh, the American uh, experience. It's kind of like a PBS channel show, history show, that I saw a few years ago, and I made notes on it because it was so intriguing to hear about the Dust Bowl. Did any of y'all ever learn about the Dust Bowl in, uh, in high school? Well, I'm sure they taught it, but I wouldn't have remembered it because I was probably staring out the window, you know, at the playground or or the football field or something like that. Uh, but uh, it was intriguing to me to, to see and understand and learn the history about it. I'll share some of that history with you this morning. The Southern Plains consist of the masses of the land 
uh, where the borders of Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas meet. The Homestead Act of 1862 encouraged settlement and development of, offer, of, of uh, development offering settlers 160 acres of farmland. Think about back in that day, broke people. Man, an opportunity to have 160 acres was massive. With the end of the Civil War, uh, many were looking for a new and a better life. Uh, these hopes, along with the government advertisement, uh, helped to get them out there. There was, you could Google it up, you could see pictures of, they'd have a farmer with his hat off and he'd be riding on a big old uh, ear of corn the size of a horse wagon being pulled by horses. And uh, they might show a, uh, uh, some of the cash crop and it would be like Goliath giant pictures of men standing, standing beside big old huge uh, crops. And uh, it was advertisement to get them out there. It was promise of a better future. There were millions of acres of virgin topsoil out in the plains at that time, 10 inches thick topsoil. Man, they had developed, that had developed over thousands of years and an unusually wet period um, of time and period of season in, in the plains had led the government officials to believe that the climate had changed for good. They thought that where it used to, this was a dry, barren desert, that now with this, this uh, rainy season that had lasted for several years and fertilized the ground, uh, that now it was, it was a climate change that would last. And by the 1930s, the plains were, gro were growing record, record crops while the rest of the country was in the Great Depression. So it was a thriving place. When we were suffering here, uh, over there in the plains, they were, they, were, they were growing massive crops and prospering. By World War I, Washington, D.C. wanted... Uh, uh, wanted wheat because wheat would win the war, in their opinion. You had to feed troops, and you had to feed animals. You had to feed horses. You need, wheat was the most valuable crop that there was. Uh, for men, uh, uh, race to, uh, uh, to the west to go and to turn every inch of soil because there was such a great need. There were father and son teams and they would have, you know, they didn't have the massive tractors back then, but there were father and son teams to where they would plow 24 hours around the clock. A father would take a 12-hour shift, shift, shift during day. A son would come in and take a 24-hour shift at night. They were just plowing and plowing and plowing the plains, leaving no vegetation, nothing on the ground, just plowed land and so that they could grow uh, more and more. Uh, but in the summer of 1931, the rain stopped. It would not come again for a decade. Ten years it wouldn't rain. Pretty soon the plains were plagued with dust storms due to the high wind cells and erosion. The dust storms would travel as far as New York. You think about all this plowed land. Plowed land means no grass. It's just soft dirt. Now all of a sudden it gets dry and the dirt becomes sandy and it becomes light. And now all of a sudden winds start coming through those plains. And what does it do? It builds up dust, kind of like in uh, April and May of our places here. The farmers have, 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 have plowed for the crops and all of a sudden the wind gets up and it's blowing all across your house, isn't it? If you've got a field beside your house. Think about thousands and thousands of acres. It was creating dust storms that could be seen from New York all the way from the plains. Fence lines looked like sand dunes down at Myrtle Beach because the dust was built up so high. Dust was shoveled. I said shoveled out of homes. Dust would be that thick in the houses and in the homes. You'd have to brush it from your teeth. You'd have to wipe it from your food before you could eat. Wet sheets were hung by windows to keep the dust out, of, uh, out while families lived on cornbread and milk. They were poor and they were starving. Farmers were confident rain would return, so they kept planting. Kept planting in dry, plowed ground, but it's no good. They did not accept government handouts because it was a disgrace for another man to feed your family. That'll preach right there. I said they wouldn't take government handouts even as poor as they were because it was a disgrace for someone else to feed your family. Uh, we need to go say, I tell you what, let's all just go preaching that across America right there. Say amen. Pretty soon, uh, the, that pride would break while the government bought cattle and killed them because they were so poor. The cattle were such bad shape, they were, the government was buying them and then killing the animal to save the animal. Uh, from suffering. In 1935, on Black Sunday, Black Sunday would become, uh, day would become night because even in the day, the storms were so bad that it looked like it was nighttime because the dust was so thick in the air. 
And on Black Sunday, people would suffocate to death, and dust pneumonia would claim lives of many children. The lamb was so barren that cow uh, that the crows, uh, get this, the crows built nests with barbed wire because that's the only thing that they could scavenge. There was no, there was no vegetation on the land where they could build nests. Friend, that was a bad time for America, and it was a bad time for the American people. I'm sure if those people could, could uh, hear uh, the complaints of a modern generation about not getting free handouts, I'm sure they'd roll over in their graves. But here what we see is that there was plowing, and there was plowing, and there was plowing, and there was toiling, but there was not production of seed. Friend, I want you to understand today that if it was not for the gospel seed of Jesus Christ to be planting in our barren hearts, that we would be void of satisfaction in life. We would be void of supplication that we need in life. There would be no hope. There would only be suffering except for the seed of gospel be planted into the barren hearts of mankind. When we look at this passage in Matthew chapter 13, this is one of roughly seven parables that Jesus teaches. Parables are, heaven, are earthly stories with heavenly meaning. Uh, they are a way for uh, Jesus to, uh, to help his people to understand the deep truths of heaven, but it was also a way to keep those who didn't want to understand from understanding the truths of heaven. Uh, the parables were twofold. They were, had a twofold purpose. They were, one, they were to reveal the truth to those who wanted to receive it, but it was also to conceal the truth from those who did not want to receive it. We could uh, remember here that what he's doing in these parables is that he's beginning to show uh, the, the Gentile world and how he will work through the New Testament church. You understand that right now at this moment they were in, uh, they were in uh, a, a system where God had been used in the Jewish people all through the Old Testament. And Jesus came unto his own, the Jews, but his own received him not. And here now, we're fixing to see, he's beginning to teach us, okay, I am done with the Jewish people as far as using them to present myself and the, gospel and, the, and the word to the world. And because they have rejected me as a nation, they can still receive them as individuals, but as a nation, he was done with them. He put them up on the shelf. He won't get the, the Jewish nation again until the book of Revelation, when the church gets out of here. He'll begin to use the Jews as a nation again to reveal himself. But here what he's beginning to do, he's beginning to show here in these parables the church age and how he would take the Gentile world, not the Jew, but the Gentiles, that's you and me, and all other races other than Abraham, the Hebrews, and he would use the church and the Gentiles to present the gospel and, and to win people into the saving knowledge of Christ. And friend, that's what we're seeing as the overall picture here. But what we see is that Jesus come out the same day in verse 1. And it says that he came out of the house and there was a multitude there. And in verse 2, there was a great multitude gathered together that they were pressing upon him. So what did he do? He got in a ship and he went out a little bit into the sea. Uh, well, there was a big purpose for this. It was, first of all, because uh, he was to get uh, the pressing crowd off of him where he could have a little bit of room. But if you'll think about it, if you were to, uh, to look there at where they were, there was an incline, kind of like a little, uh, a little uh, hill there that would go up. So it would be almost like a stadium for them. And then the water would project his voice out. You see, he didn't have a microphone system, and he didn't have audio, he didn't have text, and he didn't have a phone where he could send everybody the message. So he's got to project his voice. And by the way, can I just say this? The reason preachers holler, used to holler all the time is because they didn't have microphones. Not necessarily because it was spiritual. Uh, but any preacher that's got a little bit of Holy Ghost in him, he'll get a little loud every now and then at least. Say amen right there. Jesus is projecting his voice out and he's beginning to give a parable here. And in this parable, uh, we look at verse 3. He talks about a sower a seed, and ground. And in verse 3, he says, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured it up. Some seed fell into the stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and became, uh, and became because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell into the thorns, verse 7, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, verse 8. But other seed fell into the good ground and brought forth fruit some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold and some thirtyfold. Now we see here the parable in verses 4 through 8. Jesus is using the illustration of a sower, of seed and of a field. In verses 
18 through 23, he gives the interpretation of the, uh, the parable. And we would understand if we were to read verses 18 through 23, we would understand that the seed is the gospel. And the sower is Jesus Christ, but it is also left uh, open-ended that we know that it's you and I as well as followers of Jesus Christ sowing forth the seed of the gospel. And we would understand in verses 18 through 23 that the soil was the hearts of men. The hearts of men. So what do we see? The big picture here is that Jesus is using this new kingdom age, this new church age, when he's going to use the Gentiles, what he's going to do? He's going to take the gospel of Jesus as a seed, and it's going to be you and I, Jesus, going through fields, through people's hearts, and throwing forth the gospel seed out, trying to get some seed to come up and to produce new life in the people's hearts. And what I want to deal with today is I want to talk about that seed and how that seed prevails. Because many times when we preach and many times when we put forth the gospel, it seems to have crop failure, doesn't it? But I want you to understand this morning, it is not the seed. The seed of God will prevail. It is a perfect word. I have a few thoughts I want to share with you. I'm not running uh, on the outline today. I'm just running off the top of my mind, and that's dangerous for me. But I had a few thoughts yesterday as I was thinking about this. One was that truly converted believers will overcome their environment. True, converted believers will overcome their environment. Do you notice that these seeds, the seed is the same, the seed is perfect, the seed is powerful, and the seed goes upon four different types of soil. It goes upon a hard soil, which is a hard-hearted person, and the birds eat it up. It falls upon a shallow soil, which was about that deep, and there's solid rock in some places in Israel, and then there'll just be an inch of topsoil, and a seed that can come up, but it can't be rooted, and then it gets dry, and the sun scorches it, and it goes out quick. That is someone who, would, uh, who quickly receives the gospel with an and with joy, and uh, they disappear not long after when they find out it's kind of, uh, what you mean, I've got to come to church faithfully? I've got a tithe? I got <laughs> Poof, gone. Did they get saved and lose it? No, they never got it. Then there's the seed that, that falls upon the, uh, the, the thorny places. In other words, thorns and thistles overtake the seed. There's too much grass. There's too much weed in it. That is concern for money in the world. I'd rather hang out with the boys. I'd rather do my life. I'd rather make piles of money than I had to sacrifice time and money and treasure to the gospel. But then there was the good soil, wasn't there? And this produces, this seed is powerful within that soil because it produces fruit. Uh, some 30, some 60, and even more fold. Uh, it's productive. So what we understand is that truly converted believers will overcome their environment. You say, well, you don't know what family I came from, and you don't know the influences around me, and that's why I don't go to church. Friend, I want to tell you, truly converted people will overcome their environment. Uh, you say, well, uh, I've got a lot going on right now, and I've got college, and I'm, I'm trying to find a girlfriend, and I'm trying to do this, or I've got exams, and I've got this, and I've got that, and my life is just heading it right now. I can give God attention later. Can I just tell you right now that truly converted people will overcome their environment, and God will be the priority. And the reason that God is not a priority in professing people's lives today is because God is not in their lives today. That's a hard message, but that's true. Well, look, we see that truly converted people, believers, will overcome their environment. True belief also entails repentance. You see, it's more than just believing in Jesus. Yeah, I know Jesus. I believe in him. Yeah, Jesus, death, burial, resurrection, died on the cross, went back to heaven. I know all that stuff. Hey, I'm good with it. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. But you see, true salvation will also entail repentance. You see, the gospel, Mark 1.15, God's, uh, Jesus' first message was repent and believe. We've told you before, it's like the uh, faith, the true faith, saving faith is like a double side, a coin. It is one coin, but it has two sides. You cannot separate belief and repentance, for they both come together and manifest unto salvation. Anyone who is believing in Jesus will have a form of repentance, and anybody who is in repentance will have, true repentance will have a form of belief there with it. It is inevitably and inseparable to have uh, for salvation. You must have Repentance along with belief. Uh, we see in this passage, we see that the four types of, of soil. We have one, the hard wayside, that completely rejects the gospel, doesn't want it. Amen. I can respect them more than I can false professors. Because I don't know where you stand. I'd rather a man look at me and say, Preacher, I, I understand it. I ain't want it. I don't want it. I don't want to do it. 
I can respect him more than one to say, yeah, I'm saved. I got saved when I was two years old. Ain't been back to church for whole life. I'd, I'd rather deal with that man that says that he's completely not saved because I know where he stands. And he's got more potential to be saved than the one that's playing games with God. Aren't you glad you come to church this morning? Say amen right there. There was one that rejected the gospel, but there was two that were false professors in the gospel. So what's the opportunity within the church to have plenty of false professors, people who have not really been converted, but they said a prayer, they walked the aisle, they got baptized when they was a baby, they, what, what you, you name it, all of the religious works that one can have. But we see the minority is those who truly receive Jesus Christ and they produce, uh, they produce seed and produce fruit. Not only that, but uh, true conversion will mandate that a believer's walk in life will be different. Their walk will be different. You see it in verse 23, but those who received the good ground, there was fruit and production of fruit. And there was a changed life. There was a changed walk. When you really see salvation, your walk will change. And I want to tell you tonight, if you're walking with the world, I want to tell you tonight, if you're hanging out in the bars, you're drinking up, getting drunk, hanging out with women in relationships you ought not be in, having sex outside of marriage, I just want to tell you tonight, you're not right with Almighty God. And God's not in it to play games today. I want to tell you tonight, upon the authority of God's Word, that God will judge those who go against Him. And it is dangerous grounds for a Christian who has been born again, who is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, to begin to dabble in the ways and the world of sin. Friend, I want to tell you, this is not no game. If you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you better get your life cleaned up. You better yield to Him, get your attention one way or the other. I promise you this way is the best way. Get down here and admit it than it is for God to begin to toil and pull weeds out of your life. There will be a difference of change and walk. But also this seed must be scattered if the lost are to make a decision. Don't you understand that unless you and I begin to scatter the seed of the gospel, nobody's going to get any seed on their hearts and there's not going to be a production unto salvation. We must be producing and we can only produce if we're actually scattering seed. I want to tell you something, scattering seed is more than, and I'm not trying to be mean this morning, I'm just telling you, it's more than just putting out on Facebook. It's more than, that, that's easy. We've got to be planting seed one-on-one -on -one confrontational witnessing. Maybe that's in your home. Maybe that's in your workplace. Maybe that's in your areas of life is where you come to the point that you begin to see the need in people's lives. And when the opportunity arises and when God gives a divine appointment that you really confront them and plant the seed of the gospel one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And Maybe you ask them, would you mind if I share the gospel with you? And they say yes, and you, are, uh, you have trained and studied enough that you understand the Romans road, and you can at least walk them through and say the, a planned way of salvation. We've got to plant seed. We've done that this week through revival. Many of you invited people, and you know what you did when you invited people? You gave opportunity for the powerful seed of the gospel to go into their hearts. And just because they didn't respond this week, you know what? That seed is still there. Now, we'll see if the environment will allow the seed to produce. Friend, I want you to understand that the gospel seed is powerful. Let me read to you about this word of God that we're putting forth. Many times when we don't see, uh, many times when we don't see uh, people uh, come to salvation after we've given the gospel, what we will do is we will accuse the gospel of not being powerful. We will say, well, the gospel really doesn't work like we think it is. or that it, No, it's not the powerful gospel seed, but it is the person and the environment that is put upon. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. What we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfectly, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The gospel is transforming to people, but they've got to receive it by Jesus Christ. Not only that, but we could also see in Hebrews chapter 4 
and uh, verse 12, Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It is the word of God that can peer down to where you and I can't, and it can begin to search out an individual. And many of those that came this week into this place and heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and perhaps they thought they had got out the back door without uh, making it unscathed in the religious world and said, I won't come back again. Uh, they had a seed that went with them. The Holy Ghost will wake them up in the middle of the night and on the way home and in a, a week or two weeks or three weeks that seed will still be there. But we will see what the ultimate end of production will be because it will decide upon the heart condition of that person. Not only there, but this seed that we are dealing with, we could see in Psalms chapter 19. Psalms chapter 19 and verse 7 says this, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. Can I tell you, your seed, gospel seed, will never go bad. The true, inerrant, infallible word of God will never go bad. But I want to tell you one thing that will uh, make it look like it's bad is those who pervert the gospel. Uh, it, would look like, uh, it would look like the Jehovah's Witness who's try to, who try to take an A-like gospel seed, they try to make it look like it and begin to scatter it. It's false seed, it's no good. Could be like the Mormons who are throwing forth false seed that looks so close to the real thing and, and it's a fake seed. But I want to tell you, you, when you give the inerrant, infallible word of Almighty God and you've got it right and correct, you have been stewards, you have been Bereans as the Bible was in Berea. Uh, Brother Greg, if you don't mind, just lay your Bible beside you there so uh, it don't keep falling out. I appreciate you. I love you. Uh, what we see today is that uh, we got to give forth the true seed of the gospel. And that requires study. And that requires preparation. We don't like to hear that, do we? You want to hear a preacher get up here? Boy, I ain't trying to be mean nature this morning, but I'm just trying to be real. You want to hear a preacher get up here and run down the aisles and holler and scream and go all over the place and, and uh, do all these hum haul hollers and all this stuff. But friend, we need to be in the Word. And we need to understand the Word. And I'm going to tell you what, a Christian that can't even, can't even tell someone how to be saved, I doubt if they've ever been saved. The seed is not the problem. The seed is powerful. And the seed will work. We're going into some harsh conditions, aren't we? Uh, boy, it's a harsh world out there to be planting seed, I'm telling you. Boy, if you don't believe it, you probably just go down to Sister Dot's neighborhood, right? Yeah. That's different people. It's hard in, down here in the south for, for us southerners that are in southern communities because most of them are religious. Yeah, I, I know that. I got that. Dylan, Dylan, my son Dylan was just recently this week, he was down in Utah and he was talking about how everywhere, that, all that is is Mormon country. Everywhere you go, Mormon, 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 Mormon. Can you imagine going there as they did and how that church planter from North Carolina that's there trying to overcome the false seed, the wheat, the tares and the wheat there, to overcome that? You better believe you've got a powerful seed, a powerful word, and if you plant that, it's going to come up. You see, many times we accuse the seed of being crop failure, but uh, it is not. It is the heart condition of the person. We look and we see in verse 9, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. The parable. Whoever can hear this, whoever can understand this, let them hear it. Let them understand it. That means that some were incapable of hearing the word. Some were incapable of hearing the word. You see, Jesus had spoke to people the word had went forth, but also there had to be a calling and a moving and a working of the Holy Spirit in people's lives for them to receive it. We looked this, this week, in fact, we, uh, this week we had many lost people in here. And there was one that received that with, by faith, but there were many that did not. Don't you understand that the conditions of the soil of the heart was part of that? The gospel seed fell on, but at the same time, one allowed the Holy Spirit of God to come in and begin to work in his heart and bring him unto salvation. The Word and the Spirit worked together, but there were others that had the same Word coming forth, but they had no interpretation of the Holy Spirit. They couldn't hear it. Why? Because they were rejecting it. They were just like we see here the reason Jesus was te teaching in parables is because what he was doing, there was Jewish scribes and Pharisees there. They were actually religious people and they knew the Old Testament better than, than you and I do today. 
And uh, they were not willing to believe the gospel regardless of what Jesus had done. They were trying to probe and prick him. If he'd have gave them the outright message, they'd have found a way to, to, to point at him. It would have been kind of like a State of the Union address for a president. If you know, I won't call one. Y'all know, y'all know who I would like to go to, but I'm not going to let politics or the left or the right disturb this message of the gospel this morning. Whether it's a Republican or whether it's a Democrat, the president at the time will get up there and he'll put forth all of these statistics of all that he'd done. We know it was a lie. He just manipulated the numbers and, 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 and it looked at them from a different shade tree than what we was. And there'll be one side that'll stand up and they'll, yeah, look what we did. But then over here, there's another group over here that uh, ain't budging. It doesn't matter if it's truth or not. A lot, most of it's lies, but whoever's up there giving the information, some of it is truth, and some are not receiving truth, and some are receiving truth. And it's kind of like that with what Jesus is doing here, that regardless of the truth that he gives, there are some that are not going to receive it regardless. And you know what? That's why he's telling parables. So the ones that want to receive it can receive it, and these that don't want to receive it won't understand it, so they could use it against him. It's only given to some to receive it. You see, I think, uh, I think it was J. Vernon McGee that gave a good point on this, the spirit working with the word. If you would remember the Ethiopian eunuch in the gospel of, of, uh, in, in Acts. And uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was a, a wealthy man, and he had a copy of Isaiah's text. He had a copy of the word of God. That was unheard of in that day. It took more piles of money to buy a copy of the word. And he was reading it, and he just couldn't understand it. But the Holy Spirit of God sent Philip all the way to him, traveled a long way. So that he could climb up in that wagon, take a little ride with the eunuch. And uh, then the, uh, he could interpret the word of God for him. And the eunuch, uh, Ethiopian eunuch, be saved by the blood of Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God working in the midst of the word that's being put forth. It takes both. What am I saying? Someone in their pride and arrogance with their wayside seed, hard-hearted, I'll get saved when I want to. You will never get saved. You'll bust hell wide open because God does not visit those who are proud and boastful. It's just the truth. Holy Spirit won't touch you. You can hear it, know it, study it, read it. There's theologians that aren't saved that know everything of the word that you and I know, but they're not saved. Why? Because their hearts are so hard the Holy Spirit will not deal with them in it. We've got to be tender and God's got to be moving. That's why we're praying. That's why we were praying during this revival and we're still praying for awakening. But we're, we're doing more than just preaching. But what we're doing is we're praying, oh God, would you do a move? Would you begin to work? Holy Spirit, would you take our efforts? Would you take our witnesses? Would you take the word? Would you manifest it in people's hearts? Oh God, would you deal with people's hearts outside so that the community can begin to see the truth of the gospel and be prepared? Because it's going to take more than just going forth and giving forth the word, but we've got to go forth in truth of the word, but also with the power of the Holy Spirit of God anointing. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear it. Preacher, I don't believe nothing you say this morning. You ain't got ears to hear. You're prideful. Your heart is not right. You're either hard-hearted. You're either more concerned with the world, or either you are just so shallow that you don't want to be persecuted for the gospel's sake or be obedient to what the, the disciplines of the gospel are. But thank God for those that have got some good soil that are saved by the blood of Jesus that will produce multitude. Verse 11, look, look with me at that. He answered and said unto them, uh, they, they asked in verse 9, they, or excuse me, verse 10. Uh, or verse 10, and the, and the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? <coughs> they were confused about it. Jesus, why are you, why are you doing this in parables? We, we don't quite understand. Why don't you just tell us Verses 18 through 23, right off the bat. And uh, we see in, in verse 11, And he answered and said to them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. But to them it is not given. Who is the them? The them is talking about the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious community of that day who were unwilling to receive the gospel of Christ. They were the wayside soil. They were the hard-hearted soil that even though the seed was falling on their hearts, it was so hard that the devil could come by and scoop it up just as soon as they receive it. What did he say? It's given to you, those who are believers, those uh, who have good hearts, those who are producing fruit. It is for you to understand these truths for them is not. In, 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 uh, probably in reality, 
Uh, he was also doing this probably to restrain judgment from those who were not going to believe. You see, you're going to give a judgment one day on account of how much you knew of the gospel. And the more revelation that you have in the gospel, the more revelation that you have, the more you're going to give account for. So it could have been an act of the grace of God to restrain some of this knowledge from them because one day they were going to die and bust hell wide open and they would be accounted for more knowledge and rejection of God than what they would have if he had came forth to them. But what do we see? It says the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Verse 12, for whosoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance. He's still talking about these who could receive and these who could not receive. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away that which he hath. Verse 12, oh my goodness, we can get on all kinds. We can get on all kinds of bad doctrine right here if we're not careful. Can't we? We can get on all kinds of bad doctrine right here if we're not careful. We can get on all kinds of bad doctrine right here if we're not careful. Say amen right there. But what we understand here, if we look at this verse and we interpret it according to the context of what we see here, what it's saying is that for whosoever hath, verse 12, to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance. What is it saying? Look at verse 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. What happens? He also beareth forth fruit. What's he doing? Being productive. He's bearing forth more. He's bearing forth uh, uh, he's bringing forth some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. So when we look at verse 23, understanding those that will receive it, to verse 12, for whosoever hath the seed of God, for whoever hath a good heart to receive it, for those who receive the truth of the gospel and are converted and changed, they will have more because they will produce more. That's the good thing about being saved by the blood of Jesus Christ is that, listen, you don't get saved and you have to stay on the same level that you are. But you can produce more and you can grow closer with God and grow closer with God. Some of y'all are doing that. I, lo I love to watch a lot of the young people a lot of times that get in church and become faithful. Because you see them come from a kind of a lax state and they become faith more faithful and more faithful and then they begin to serve and then they step up and they really start becoming mature adults, excuse me, mature Christians in the faith. Begin to witness to people and talk to people and begin to see fruit produce. To him that hath will more be given. You see, the closer you are with God and the more you walk with God and the more you yield to God and the more you understand about God's Word, the more you produce fruit in your Christian walk. You're not satisfied with being where you were five years ago, two years ago, or even a month ago. Because once you, once you lead someone to salvation, I'll tell you what, you want to lead somebody else to salvation. When you lead somebody else to salvation, you want to lead more to salvation. You want to do more for the Lord. Verse 12, those that have will be given more. But... Whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken that that he hath. There were three types of soil that, did, that received the seed of the gospel. What was happening? The seed was taken away, wasn't it? I think he's really talking about that wayside seed there uh, that we see the first wayside seed. What happens? The, the birds. That was the devil. Uh, interpreted in verse 18 through 23. The devil came by just as soon as it was, uh, just as soon as the seed was thrown on the ground, he come by and the devil came by and scooped it up like an old bird when you throw that, uh, uh, that old rice seed out there on the wedding day. Birds start flocking around and eating all of the seeds. It's taken away. Those who have not the true salvation, the knowledge that they have will be taken away. It also makes me think of Romans chapter 1. And in Romans chapter 1, what we can understand from that is that in verses 18 through 30 and verses 18 through 20, we understand that every person that enters into this world has a knowledge of the gospel. We all have a knowledge of the gospel. And it's enough knowledge to, to damn us, but not enough to save us. And I like the way some have said, I believe it was Aiden Rogers years ago said, we all have a candle light of a flame of knowledge of God in us. We're born with it in conscience and creation. And as we respond positively to the knowledge that we have, it gets bigger. The flame gets bigger and bigger until it boils out into a bonfire of true saving faith. But those who reject it and those who are hard-hearted toward it, that flame gets smaller and smaller and smaller until one day God blows it out and there's no more opportunity for salvation. Their heart is foolishly darkened and damned for all of eternity. Why? 
Because, I mean, everybody should at their deathbed. They know they're fixing to die. They're drawing their last breaths. And they're still a, alert enough that they know they're fixing to go into something on the other side. They ought to decide at that time, well, I think I'll get right with God right now. Yeah, I'm going to get right with God right now so I can get saved and go to heaven. Wouldn't that be a sensible thing to think? You would think so. But don't forget it's more than man's choice, but it's also the Holy Spirit of God working around His Word. We don't necessarily get saved when we want to. We get saved when God is calling us and we yield to His call. There is assistance in the Holy Spirit of God. It is more than just seed being thrown forth. I want you to understand something in closing. I want you to understand something in closing. That you're, you've got to be content as a sower just giving forth the Word of God regardless of whether it produces salvation or whether it produces eternal damnation. You see, our job is just to sow forth the seed of the gospel. And you've got to be content with the gospel. It is the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first and also to the, to the Greek. This is the perfect word of God. It has saved my soul. It has transformed me. And I am content with giving this gospel to people, whether they get saved or whether they don't. You see, where we get downhearted many times is because we thought that just because we gave the gospel and just because we said it in just the right way that somebody was going to get saved and we get depressed and unconcerned anymore. And then we say, well, my, God, it's not, my, my gospel isn't powerful. No, the gospel is powerful. You've got to be content with giving the gospel to men's hearts. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission, He said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. And what did he say? Go forth, therefore, uh, baptizing them and making disciples, sending forth the gospel, produce throwing seed. And you've got to be content with this, that yes, people are going to get saved and you want to see them saved, but you've got to be content with this, that God's grace has allowed a lost sinner to have some seed on his heart, even though and die and go to the devil's hell. That's God's grace. Because God gave lost sinners an opportunity for salvation if they would just yield to Him. Isn't that gracious? I don't want one person to die in, in this world in Horry County. I don't want one person to die in the United States of America without having the opportunity to have seed thrown upon his heart and then make a, a conscious choice and be dealt with by the Holy Spirit of God and have opportunity for salvation. I want everybody. That's why we got to be content with the gospel. Just be content giving the gospel to this one, to that one. And don't become downhearted when they don't receive Christ. Be satisfied that God was gracious enough to give them the opportunity for salvation. But also, we've got to be content because just because you give the gospel one time doesn't mean that someone's going to be converted at that moment. Paul said in Corinthians, he said, some watered, some planted, some brought in the harvest, but God gave the increase. God gave the increase. When someone gets saved, it's not just a work of some, some hot preacher that prayed enough that day and brought the right message and it, that's involved in it. But it was a mom and daddy probably planted seed. It was a, a preachers along the way that planted seed, pastors that planted seed, co-workers that planted seed. Uh, all kinds of things come into effect, and then it is produced. It might be that the seed that you gave that you thought was a barren seed, it might just be that it comes up a little bit later on down the road and manifests. The seed's got to be preserved. It's a process to some degree of God moving and working. And friend, what am I telling you today? The gospel is powerful. The gospel transforms lives. And get this, if you're saved and been transformed, you're going to want to give that seed to other people that they can be saved. Are you a New Testament sower? Are you a New Testament sower? Are you sowing the Word of God? Let me ask you this. Are you concerned about your friends? Are you concerned about winning them to Jesus? Are you concerned about meeting them at, at 8 o'clock tonight to go hang out? That's the truth of it. Are you concerned about your co-workers to some degree to, uh, to try to in some ways be a are you worried about being a witness and a testimony to them? Or are you worried about trying to be cool and hang out with them? The New Testament sower is one who's concerned about putting the seed forth. He understands that the seed is perfect. And the seed will conquer and set out to do. It will do what it's.
set out to do. It will accomplish great things. I want you to understand today, keep spreading the seed. Friend, I want you to understand today that we all need to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And today, you've got a choice. And your heart condition is going to, uh, what's going to control that. Are you hard-hearted to the gospel? Are you shallow and concerned with the world? Are you shallow Christian? Friend, don't you understand today? We need people who will produce. We need to be people who will produce. And when we as a congregation begin to produce, you'll begin to see a harvest. You'll begin to see more visitors. You don't know why? Because people will be here because you invited them. Uh, a few years ago, as musicians come forward, just play softly for a minute, Renee, and, and uh, we'll, we'll get through this. Um, if you'll play softly for me. A few years ago, over at Iron Hill Baptist Church, uh, I was in a revival. I was preaching that meeting for a week. And uh, it was a mighty move of God. The, really, the, one of, really what I would call really true heaven-sent revivals that I was involved in and preached. And that week, people every night were, were coming down and being saved. And after the meetings, after the end of the meeting that night, I'd be in this room, people, so many people coming up wanting to know about salvation. I'd be taking a, a young couples into this room to talk with them. The pastor would be taking them in other, another room and talking with them. And just every night, people getting saved. And I wasn't preaching no different. I wasn't praying no different. I didn't feel no different. I mean, it wasn't no fuzzy feeling fairy dust that week that I got into by accident. Just normal preaching and proclaiming the word and that last night there was a guy there that had been in a wheelchair all week his name was Michael and M Michael roughly four to five years before had actually helped paint and uh, rebuild the church they had had a cosmetic uh, rebuilding reconstruction on the church and he had painted that sanctuary he was lost as Hogan's goat and Michael was still lost but he, now he was formed up. He had had a stroke. He still had right mind, but his body was limited, and he was in a nursing home. He was in a wheelchair. He couldn't, couldn't move his arms just a little bit, and his legs wouldn't move very good, and on the altar call, I was just speaking to the people like normal, and that night, I didn't realize it until he had made it all the way to the altar. I was looking the opposite way. Michael had thrown himself out of that wheelchair, and he took his elbows, and he was scooting to the altar. Michael got saved on the altar that night. Friend, I can't tell you anything, but there was two things. First of all, the Holy Spirit had moved and sat down and was doing something special. But you want to know what really was the reason? Is because there was lost people there to hear the gospel. There was a lady in that church that was bringing all the people from the uh, nursing home. These were people who were in rehabilitation side. They had a great need. They were sick. But they had right minds and they were being brought. They had a need. They saw their need. Their hearts were tender. When the gospel went forth, they were believing it. They were receiving it. Because somebody was bringing them in. Somebody was concerned for their souls. A lot of other people were inviting people and bringing people that week. And friend, I just want to tell you this morning, we need to be inviting people. We need to bring people under the sound of the gospel. We need to be witnesses in the world, but we also need to be trying to get them in here and teach them and train them and get the gospel into them. Friend, you can preach all day salvific messages, but if there's nobody lost here to hear them, you might find a church member that's unsaved every now and then, but we've got to have lost people under the sound of the gospel. Be a sower. Be a sower. And expect the Holy Spirit to move. Let us pray, and then we'll go to a time of our call. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all your blessings. Help us, Lord. Help us. Help us, Holy Ghost. Help us to understand the message this morning. God, move in our hearts and our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand and sing, be obedient.